All right, so thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, what I would like to do is that uh, I would like to finish what uh, we were discussing about uh, chapter five. And uh, there was one last diagram that I wanted to discuss with you. And this diagram is called the Hellingham diagram. We're talking a little bit about uh, pyrometallurgy and how we actually extract metals from their oxides. As uh, we were talking in the previous class, uh, most metals don't, are actually not found or not mined as the metals themselves. They are mined as the oxides because the oxides are abundant. They, they have, the metals have been in contact with oxygen for so long through millions of years that they have uh, become metal oxides. So there must be a way in which we can convert easily metal oxides into metals. And this is what pyrometallurgy is about, how we convert these things. Uh, and, and I think I was telling you that one of the first metals that were, uh, that were actually uh, used for making tools and, and other things and weapons uh, was copper. And the reason why copper became so uh, useful in, uh, in ancient uh, ages, basically 6,000 years ago, is because uh, copper has a low temperature, a relatively low temperature of reaction uh, with carbon. So it can, carbon can be used as a reducing agent. And in the process of uh, carbon uh, oxidation, then it reduces the metal oxide into metal. So the temperatures for achieving that with copper, it, they're actually relatively low. Uh, for iron, they're higher. I'm going to show you uh, the diagram in a second. Uh, so it took, it took thousands of years for human beings being able to figure out how to increase the temperature enough. So uh, being able to, to have appropriate uh, free energies of reaction, so this reaction could occur So, let me see where my is. The, the Ellington diagram basically has, or basically is a plot of the Gibbs reaction energy for uh, uh, metal, uh, it's basically the Gibbs reaction energy for the oxidation reaction of a metal to the metal oxide or carbon to carbon, uh, carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. And, uh, it is a function of temperature. So basically, it will give you the, the Gibbs energy for the oxidation reaction at different temperatures. And it turns out that if you know that, that's basically all you need to know uh, to figure out at what temperature uh, these reactions occur. Uh, but I will, I'm going to tell you uh, right away that basically what we are looking for is the temperature at which the metal metal oxide line. Uh, as you can see here in red, basically intercepts the carbon-carbon monoxide line. So when the line for the metal to the metal oxide falls above the line uh, for the oxidation of carbon to carbon monoxide, then carbon can be used to uh, reduce the metal oxide. So that point right there identifies that the minimum temperature that you need uh, to be able to drive this reaction. Carbon being oxidized to carbon monoxide and uh, working as a reducing agent to reduce the metal oxide to the metal. So diagram will have different parts. Basically, uh, there are different curves because of course when you add carbon, which can be in the form of coal or in the form of coke, uh, basically, you can have carbon uh, becoming carbon monoxide, you can have carbon becoming carbon dioxide, and you can have carbon monoxide becoming carbon dioxide. So these three reactions of carbon can occur, and they will have different behaviors and different temperatures, which are associated with the change in the entropy uh, for changing carbon to carbon monoxide, or carbon to carbon dioxide, or carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. Uh, but basically, this is the thing, and then you have the lines for the metal. Different metals become a metal oxide. So I'm going to show you how the real diagram looks like. 
And this is an Elihan diagram. Unfortunately, they forgot to put, for example, this blue line here is a carbon to carbon monoxide. Uh, I mean, this is kind of like green. Carbon to carbon monoxide. This blue line here is carbon to carbon dioxide. And this magenta line here is carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. But basically, what you have to see is the temperature at which the metal oxide lines actually cross these lines. Because those are the minimum temperatures that are necessary for carbon to start uh, behaving as a reducing agent. So let's take any, for example. Uh, this is zinc here. So as you can see, at temperatures, uh, at room temperature, carbon cannot be used to uh, uh, reduce zinc oxide into zinc. But if you can increase in the temperature, right, you're going to see if that at some point, the zinc oxide line crosses the carbon to carbon monoxide line. So when that happens, then at that temperature specifically, which is about, uh, I don't know, uh, 1200 degrees Celsius, then uh, carbon will be, will, or the, the, the reaction of carbon to becoming carbon monoxide and zinc to become zinc metal, then it will be favorable. So that's basically what you do in these kind of diagrams. You look for the crossing points, and then you will be able to see what kind of reaction you can make. You can see that zinc crosses this green line there, and it crosses the blue line here, which is a little bit high in temperature. So when you're able to cross that line there, then you can, you can perform the other reaction, which is carbon being oxidized to carbon dioxide, and then zinc being oxidized to zinc metal. And the same when you cross the magenta line. So the more lines you cross, the more reactions can occur with carbon. Uh, the important thing generally is what is the first line you can cross, and, and you can be situated at home. Um, if you see, for example, aluminum here, do you see aluminum? This aluminum oxide. Uh, due to the increase in temperature of aluminum, you actually have to go a long way before you actually have an appropriate give, uh, energy to perform this reaction. So actually, you have to be about 23, uh, 23, or, uh, yeah, 2300 degrees Celsius for this reaction to be spontaneous, for carbon being able to reduce alumi aluminum oxide into aluminum. Um, why do we use carbon? Carbon is not a fundamentally good reducing agent. What other reducing agents do you know from your organic chemistry class or for anything? Do you know any redu reducing agents? Hydrogen gas is a reducing agent. What else? Basically, metals of alkali metals are relatively good reducing agents. Have you ever heard about lithium hydride or sodium hydride? Hydrides are good reducing agents too. Why we don't use hydrides or metals? lithium metal, or sodium metal, or potassium metal, to reduce other metals like aluminum oxide or you know, magnesium oxide. Why we don't do that? There must be a reason, yes. Uh, carbon is cheap and abundant. Yes, carbon is cheap and abundant. So if you can find a way of using carbon, which you can mine as coal, uh, which is relatively cheap, and then use it to perform these kind of reactions, then although it might not be the most uh, uh, convenient reducing agent to use. Uh, it will be appropriate because, uh, you know, economically, it's feasible. It's feasible for many elements, and it's not feasible for other elements. For example, as I was telling you for aluminum, the temperature that you need to actually achieve for converting aluminum oxide into aluminum metal using carbon is extremely high. Actually, you don't use pyrometallurgy to convert aluminum oxide into aluminum metal. Do you know what kind of like reaction is used? Well, you basically use electrochemical metals. So you go to a country where electricity is cheap, and then you, uh, you uh, drive this reaction 
using electrochemical methods, in which, uh, again, uh, aluminum is one of these metals that are the 20th century metals. Because before, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, have enough electricity to perform these processes, or it was not economically feasible using pyrometal. And aluminum, again, one of the main reasons for using aluminum is similar to what we were discussing before, aluminum oxide is extremely abundant. So although producing aluminum might be somewhat expensive, the raw material for producing aluminum is cheap. So if it is abundant, it is available, then, you, then it is convenient and economically feasible at the end to use it. Another reason also is that aluminum is easily recyclable. And that is all the fuss about recycled aluminum because once the aluminum is in the form of the metal, then it's very easy to be recycled and used again. One more thing that I want to say about the Ellingham diagram is that you don't have to use necessarily carbon. In theory, you can use any of the species that are in the diagram. Uh, let me explain myself. Basically, any time that you see a cross, like for example here, that means that in theory, uh, if I have magnesium oxide in the presence of aluminum, let's say, so aluminum is this line, magnesium oxide is this line, uh, I could use aluminum metal to uh, uh, convert magnesium oxide into magnesium at temperatures that are superior to this crossing here. So above uh, 1600 degrees, I can use aluminum metal to convert magnesium oxide into magnesium. Uh, do you understand uh, Ellingham, Ellingham diagrams? Do you have any questions? It is very well explained in the book as well, but this is the basic about how to use how to use an Ellingham diagram. We are good, right? Because if we are, then we are done with chapter, uh, this is chapter five, we are done with chapter five, and then we can, we can start with chapter uh, three. So, one of the things that I, that I think that are uh, wonderful about chemistry, specifically about inorganic chemistry, is the structure of uh, solids, solid materials. In organic chemistry, uh, we talk a lot about molecules, how to make molecules, how these molecules uh, can, uh, can react to form other molecules, how you create bonds between molecules. All those things are extremely important. But uh, in inorganic chemistry, we introduce uh, something else. We, we start looking at materials which can be regarded as a very big supramolecules, or they can be regarded as, um, as uh, an arrangement of molecules. And uh, I want to, I want to start talking about some of the Some of the definitions that we use for solid materials. First of all, uh, what solid materials do you know? When you think about solid materials, what do you think of? Carbon well, carbon nanotubes are solid materials, yes. Um, what else? Ah, we are, come on, we are surrounded with solid materials, okay? What about, let's talk about uh, metals, for example. Are metals solid materials? Yes or no? Most of the time, uh, specifically, or more fundamentally, metals when they are in the zero state, they form metallic, uh, uh, metallic materials. And uh, what can you tell me about a metal? 
anything that you can tell me about a metal. How do you know what is different between a metal and, for example, this desk right here where you're sitting? What difference have a metal and a plastic or other kind of things? Metals are generally shiny. That's true. What else? Sorry? They, can, they are malleable, so they are easily uh, reshaped into different forms. Anything else? They, con they conduct electricity. Uh, that's a general characteristic of a metal. Um, well, they are, they are different parameters, and one of them are, for example, why metals form. And uh, we can talk, for example, about metallic bonding. So what bond molecules in a metal so the metal is a metal, right? So there are two different, there are two different uh, ways in which we can understand that. Metallic bonding can be described in two ways. Amir, can you see the board if I turn on the light? Or yeah, it, it has a hard time. Yeah, it, Should I leave it off? If it's off, the camera can, ca and can record can it, better. it better. Yeah. Let's see. Can you see what I'm writing on the board? Okay. So metallic bonding can be described in two ways. Uh, one way is that it occurs When each atom loses one or more electrons, to a common electron C. Imagine that metal atoms uh, are not that electronegative. So theoretically, they are somewhat willing to donate those electrons. That is fundamentally true for uh, most of the metals, alkali metals, and uh, many of the alkaline metals. Transition metals tend to be like that too. They are more stable. But certainly, they are somewhat electropositive uh, materials or atoms. They tend to donate electrons. So imagine that. When you have a piece of metal, you can have many of these metallic uh, atoms donating electrons to a pool, to a sea of electrons. And this sea of electrons, imagine a gigantic electronic cloud, negatively charged electronic cloud, holding together these positively charged atoms. And uh, that electronic cloud, it can be, uh, or that kind of like metallic bonding through this electronic cloud can be rationalized to understand, for example, why metals are shiny, because light can interact very easily with this electronic cloud and be refracted. It can, uh, you can understand also as well conductivity, because this electronic cloud is very mobile. So if you put an electric potential uh, through the metal, then you are capable of moving these electrons. In this, in this sea of electrons. And also, um, it explains a little bit the malleability of metals. Because when you uh, change the shape of the metal or, or bend a cable, then that's a, that electronic cloud can, uh, can uh, reorder itself to follow the course of the atoms that are changing position. So it kind of like makes sense. There are. Uh, the, the, for, the formation of uh, metal materials uh, of metals or materials made of metal can also be understood in terms of uh, uh, molecular orbitals. So imagine that imagine metals A 
as a normal molecule with many molecular orbitals. And uh, actually, this kind of like theory about uh, considering metals as, uh, for example, each atom contributed to one orbital. Uh, if you imagine that a metal has millions and millions of atoms, then you can imagine that uh, this, uh, if you treat a piece of metal like a super molecule, then that would mean that you have millions of orbitals forming molecular orbitals. And what that's going to cause is that, I don't know if you have uh, heard this before, that the metal, instead of having dis discrete bonds, it will have a band structure, a structure of bands. So all those molecular orbitals will coalesce in bands. And that theory we actually use for uh, describing the conductance of metals and kind of like we can use it to describe why some materials are conducted, why some, con some materials are isolating, and why some, ma some materials are semiconducting. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, at the end of this chapter. But basically, this, uh, these two theories exist. This is what we call metallic bonding, but not all the molecules or not all the materials that we uh, know are made of uh, metals. We also have ionic compounds. Compounds, right? Uh, uh, tell me, for example, a single ionic compound. Any ion, ionic compound. Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is a solid. Actually, if you go to the commons and you know you're, you're having a dinner and you use salt, then you will be able to see the small crystals. But you can actually grow very big crystals of sodium chloride. So all this is part of the of the properties of sodium chloride. And uh, the bonds that maintain together uh, ions in structures like, so like sodium chloride are what we call ionic bonds. And basically, when you have an ionic compound, what you have is a bunch of ions. And this is, for example, uh, the structure of of sodium chloride, and uh, it doesn't really matter, but the red ones are chloride, and the white ones are sodium. So you can see that it forms kind of like a cubic structure. So that's the, the way that the atoms are ordered in sodium chloride structure. If you think about it for a second, um, what shape the sodium chloride crystals that you put in your food have? <coughs> have you ever seen? A sodium chloride crystal salt? No idea? They are not completely prismatic square crystals? Well, the reason why they are prismatic square crystals is because they propagate the uh, microscopic structure. And basically, what you see is that propagation becoming a microscopic structure, a square crystal made of sodium. But what keeps this structure together are ionic bonding or, or, or are ionic bonds. And these bonds are due to the charge complementarity between negatively charged uh, cations and uh, positively charged, uh, uh, negatively charged anions and positively charged cations. So basically, if we continue with this, then.
basically that's the definition of a ionic bond. Basically, the, the material is held together by uh, the interaction, by the electrostatic interaction with the negatively charged particles and positively charged particles. And these materials, again, are hard uh, as well. And basically, this chapter, chapter three, uh, we are gonna we're gonna talk mostly about uh, metals and ionic uh, particles and how they form. Although we're gonna discuss a lot of uh, structures that are rather molecular instead of ionic. Uh, so let me show you some of them. For example, uh, these two are the same, or they are basically made of the same thing. Um, can you recognize this? Can you tell me what is this? Sorry? Quartz. So what can you tell me about this molecule? Well, this is not a molecule, but this is. Anything particular? How do you, how do you recognize it was quartz and not salt or not anything else? Like it looks like quartz. I, I agree with you, it does look like quartz. But quartz has this kind of like hexagonal structure, the kind of like cylindrical hexagonal structure. This is kind of like very particular for quartz. It doesn't mean that other crystals don't uh, present this shape as well, but this is a common, uh, a, co a common morphology for quartz. Uh, can you tell me about this one? Yes, this is also quartz, but it's not called quartz. It's actually alpha quartz. Uh, uh, but this one is also quartz. Ah, by the way, do you know what quartz is made of? Silicon oxide. Very good. So quartz is made of silicon oxide. This is also quartz. But uh, these quartz have some iron impurities, generally. So it is called amethyst. Amethyst. Can you hold it a second? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. So, did you, have you ever heard about amethyst before? Uh, it was actually used by the Greeks. They, they thought that it was a very cool stone because they thought, they, they thought that, you know, the Greeks will drink heavy, right? So they would think that this uh, amethyst will have magical properties. So if you were holding or had amethyst when you were drinking, then that would give you tolerance to drink, you, you will not get drunk that easy. So if you're going to be right, <laughs> just, a, just a thought. Don't say that I said that. Ah, I'm being recorded, so. <laughs> Can you recognize this? Well, this is kind of like harder, probably, to know. Uh, but it's a common uh, crystal as well. Uh, first of all, probably, if I ask you what it is, you will tell me, well, I don't know what it is, but it's not quartz. And I will say, that's right, it is not quartz. It is a mineral that we call calcite. And what can you tell me about the shape, the morphology of this crystal? How does it look like? It looks like a like a like a parallelogram somehow, a distorted prism, right? Uh, the shape is fundamentally different than the shape of quartz. So immediately you see them, you see, you immediately realize that they are not the same. And there must be something. There must be something that is driving uh, the grow of these crystals. So this looks somewhat square, and this looks somewhat exact. I mean, this calcite is made of calcium carbonate. So it's a very common uh, mineral as well. Do you know this one? Have you seen Lord of the Ring? Or have you read Lord of the Ring? That's probably a better question. Well, it, it doesn't appear in Lord of the Rings. The Rings. But the name reminds me of a character from Lord of the Ring 
this is aragonite. And um, it is made of calcium carbonate as well. Although the shape is somewhat hexagonal, I mean the color is different, but you know, these two things are made exactly of the same, the, the composition that the, the molecular composition is very similar. Both of them are made of calcium carbonate, but both of them have different shapes. Let me see if I have something else. Oh, two more. Um, this, is gonna, this is gonna be hard to see, but this is bismuth. And uh, it, it is not a natural mineral. This is actually crystallized in the laboratory, not in my laboratory, but it's crystallized, artificially crystallized. So we can say that it's an artificial mineral. But uh, can you see it? It has a lot of a weird rectangular shapes that go up and down. So uh, again, something, something must be dictating this packet. And finally, this cube. Uh, Probably you will know, or any of you will know what it is. So what does it look like? A golden cube. Is someone tempted to say gold? Because I'm tempted to say gold. It's not gold. It's fool's gold. It's pipe. Uh, iron sulfide. And if you see this mineral, uh, this very carefully, it's a, almost a perfect square. It is remarkable. I didn't make it that way. I mean, nature did that way. That's impressive, right? So anyway, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to do, and doing a very poor job, is trying to excite you about crystals, about the shape of things about how molecular arrangements are capable of producing such a variety of different shapes and different forms. And basically, what dictates these shapes and these forms is the chemistry, the molecules that form these, the kind of bonds that get formed at the end, whether they are molecular, whether they are ionic, whether they are metallic. These things come to play an extremely important role in uh, how these minerals gain their chain. All right, so what I would like to do now is that I'm going to show you, well, I'm going to give you two more definitions, and then I'm going to show you how crystals can be formed. So first, we're going to talk about the lattice. And the lattice is a three dimensional infinite array of points. So basically, in order to generate a crystal, uh, what basically we do is that we generate a lattice. We reproduce many of these lattice points that are basically equivalent points in space uh, in three dimensions to reproduce the lattice. More fundamentally, what we reproduce is what we call the unit cell. And the unit cell is an imaginary parallel side.
So basically, a unit cell is the smallest representation of a crystal that you can have. And if you identify that unit cell, and let me take the most basic unit cell here, uh, no, a cube, then if I reproduce, if I stack these cubes in one, two, and three dimensions, that will reproduce exactly the shape of the crystal and the unit cell. So I can basically construct the crystal by repeating this unit cell in three dimensions. This is the most basic unit cell, but we can see it for uh, other unit cells. What is the importance of the unit cell? Well, here it goes. All these crystals that you see that have different shapes, they are made of different atoms, they have different shapes. They also, the, those different shapes arise because their more fundamental unit at the microscopic level is different. And what that, when that structure is reproduced in three dimensions, then they end up forming this either hexagonal or cubic or uh, you know kind of like distorted structures. But it is due to the propagation of this unit cell. So there are seven crystal groups. And fundamentally, 14 what we call Bravet lattices. Crystallographers have defined the number of unit cells that can exist. They're basically 14. So by identifying any of these 14 unit cells, you will be able to propagate a crystal in three dimensions. You don't need more than 14. 14 basically are, are enough to identify any of the known uh, structures. So I'm going to write it here. There are seven crystal systems. And uh, what I would like to do now is to identify those 14 Bravel lattices, those 14 kinds of unit cells from which crystals can be built up from the bottom. Um, so the very first one, ah, there's, there's one thing that I need to tell you. So a unit cell like this, uh, and this is the most fundamental unit cell is called the cubic. I don't know why, but I don't know. It kind of like look like a cube. But to identify a unit cell, and you can see that you know all of these that are in the front are unit cells, I need to identify <coughs> several parameters. I need to identify three sites of the molecule or of, of the unit cell, and I need to identify three angles. So the sides, we're going to call them A, B, and C, and the angles, we're going to call them alpha, beta, and gamma. So between the, uh, between the uh, sides A and B, I can find gamma, the angle gamma, between B and C, I can find alpha, and between A and C, I can find beta. So those are basically the rules. So for a cubic crystal, for a cubic unique cell, uh, 
what can you tell me about this unit cell in terms of uh, A, B, and C? A is equal to B and equal to C. What can you tell me about alpha, beta, and gamma? They are all 90 degrees, and fundamentally and consequentially, they are all equal as well, right? So for a cubic crystal system, A must be equal to B, must be equal to C, and alpha needs to be equal to beta, needs to be equal to gamma. And there's the only way for a cubic system. It's the simplest system. Um, but the cubic, the cubic system is the crystal system, but the, the cubic system can have different Bravais lattices. Actually, it can have three. So this one is the simplest one. Um, this one, what happened with this one? Notice that A is still equal to B, still equal to C, alpha is still equal to beta, is still equal to gamma. But now, this one has a lattice point or an atom, we can say, in the center, right? This is what we call a body center crystal. What about this one? This is face center, why? Right, they have atoms at the center of their faces, right? So it turns out that all of these are cubic, but they have fundamentally different names. So for example, uh, this one, We will call it primitive because it is hollow and it only has vertices. So the abbreviation for this structure is B. This is body center. So the abbreviation for this structure, we will call it I. And this is face center, and the abbreviation for face center, we will call it F. So, face center. So, there we go. These are our the first three Brave lattices. They are all cubic cubic P, cubic I and cubic F. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, how many assume that every single one of these balls is an atom? So I'm going to ask you this. How many atoms there are in a primitive cubic cell? Well, here you see eight, right? But inside the box, how many there are? One. One. Why? Um, because you can, it's like you can add seven more cubics uh, to that. Uh, it's like eight cubics share, uh, one atom is shared by right? eight cubics. I understand. I get you. Every, every one of these balls, that I, every, one of, every one of these vertices, contribute to one A. So this small piece right there is the only part of the ball that is inside the structure, right? And it contributes to one A. So and it, one, we have eight, so one A times eight means one. For a primitive cube, we'll have one molecule in what about a body center? How many molecules there are here? 
two. We have two different classes of lattice points as well, right? We have the ones that are at the very edges that will contribute to one eight, and we have eight, so eight times one eight is one, and one that is exactly in the center that will count as one because it's fully inside. So this will have two more. What about these? We will have the ones in the vertex that will count as one. And then we'll have these are in the faces and how much one of them will contribute. Half, they're basically cut in half. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, that, mean, that makes three, plus the one that we have from the ones from uh, the corners or the, the edges, then that means uh, four, right? Very good. So we have basically all the definitions. Those are important things, right? So let me go ahead and finish this crystal system. So the next one is the, is the, yeah, the triangle. So the triangle is kind of like interesting. Let me see if I find it here. Um, with this red one, if I'm not mistaken. What can you tell me about this uh, cell? I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you right away that it's different from that one because otherwise it will not have a different name. So uh, probably you can see it better here. Well, tell me the easy part. The angles. What are the angles? They are all nine, right? So alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma equal to nine. But what happened to the sides? Two of them are equal and one of them is different, right? Can everybody see it? These two are equal, this one is different. So basically, for a tetragonal crystal, A is equal to B, different than C, but alpha is equal to beta, equal to gamma, equal to 9, and T is equal to 9. And we have two. We have two. And since you already know this, let's go fast with it. This one that is what? P. And this one that is I. Very good. So we'll have, let me write it here. P and I. And let me write this here, P, I, and F. So, here we go. We have five already. So, the next one is the orthorhombic. And the orthorhombic. And we have four actually, and probably you can see better from the big one. Let's start with the angles, which is the easy one. Uh, what can you tell me about the angles? Are all equal? they're all equal, they're all 90 degrees. 90, 90, 90, all equal. But what can you tell me about the sides? They're all different. So all the angles equal, equal to 90, all the sides different. So A different than B, different than C. Alpha equal to beta, equal to gamma, equal to 90. Right? And we have four different ones. And let's go fast with this. P, I, I F, F, ah, D, 
this is just centered in the base. This is called base center. And the symbol for this will be C, the letter C. So for the orthorhombic, we have E, I, F, and C. Number four will be the rhombohedral. The rhombohedral is nice as, nice as well. Let me see if I find it fast. Here it is. What can you tell me about the size, the angles? At least they are not 90, right? Right. Uh, what can you tell me about the sides? The sides are all the same. Actually, can you see the sides? The sides are all the same. They have exactly the same length. Uh, also, if this is alpha, this is beta, and this is gamma, do you see this angle, this angle, and this angle? This A, B, and C, this alpha, beta, and gamma, do you see that they're all equal as well? Can you notice that? In the base, this is alpha, beta, and gamma. They're all equal too. So in our rhombohedral, A is equal to B, equal to C, and alpha is equal to beta, is equal to gamma, Different. And there's only one, which is P. Yeah, I mean, this white one is a different. They didn't. They ran out of color. All right. Five. Is monoclinic. And uh, the monoclinic is in here. We have two monoclinics. And what can you tell me about the monoclinic? What can you tell me about the monoclinics? A, B, C are all different. What else? Uh, and the same, and what value will they have? Well, oh, they are 90 degrees. They are 90 degrees. It's, a, it's a rectangle, right? So two of the angles are 90 degrees, one of the angles is not 90 degrees. So basically, for a monoclinic, A different than B, different than C. And uh, alpha equal to gamma equal to 90, and beta is different than B. And monoclinic, we have two, and the two are P and C. I'm going to write it. You're getting to the end. So the next one is hexagonal. That's 
very good, actually. I'm going to repeat. Uh, if you look the hexagonal through here, you will see that this bone and this bone are basically the same, right? So you have two sides that are the same, one side that is different, and then you will see that there is two angles that are 90 and that are the same, and one angle that is not 90. All right? Actually, this angle here. So this is called the hexagonal crystal, and we'll say that A is equal to B, different than C, and uh, alpha is equal to beta equal to 90, and gamma is exactly 120 degrees. And this is the only crystal that we have that will have a defined angle. Yes? Well, it is, it is defined. I mean, I, I, someone arbitrarily chose, have chosen what alpha, beta, and gamma are. I'm not. But you know, at some point, someone did. Uh, and uh, this hexagonal unit cell is what? P, primitive, right? And finally, we have our last crystal system, which is the triclinic. And this is the last one. Who wants, who wants to do this? Anyone excited about the last one? Can go home and eat. All right, I'll do it. If there's anything special you see about this, I'm gonna tell you. The special thing is that alpha is not equal to beta, I mean, A is not equal to B, that is not equal to C, and alpha is not equal to beta, and is not equal to gamma. So everything in this uh, unit cell is One more thing, and I will let you go. Why why this unit cell is called hexagonal? Well but it's, it's hexagonal kind of like implies some kind of like six sides. But it doesn't really have six sides. Yes. If you put three of them together, you would get a hexagon? Yes, that's very good. If you put three of these together, you will have a perfect hexagon. And trust me that I don't draw very well. But if I can make some kind of hexagon here, if you put three of these together, you will be hexagon. All right? All right, very good. So thank you for coming today. This has been fun, at least for me. And we will continue tomorrow with the structure of solids. Thank you.